Hallelujah. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. We're continuing our series tonight on apologetics, part two or three, depending on when you started. Praise the Lord. Um, the Bible talks about, we talked about this last week in uh, 1 Peter 3 and 13. Now, he says that, um, that we, we all need to be ready to give an answer to the hope that is within us and do it, doing it with wisdom, right? And so we talked about that. This is becoming, this is a good being a witness. Um, the best way that we can win people to God is to be able to give them an answer to the hope that is within us, especially in a time uh, that we're living in now where the, we are in what would be considered desperate times. And uh, I was just thinking as we were singing here that I've not seen, uh, I, I've not felt the unrest of the world uh, that I feel now. It's not just here in America, it's in Europe, it's, it's all over the globe. And uh, boy, it's just a sign of the times, isn't it? Again, we, uh, we, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago. When we, when we begin to see the wheels fall off of this thing, what did he say? Look up, right? Look for your redemption draweth nigh. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to his soon return. But in, in times like this, we need to be able to give, a, to give an answer. And to give an answer that is uh, appropriate. And uh, what did he say? He said that we should, Peter said that uh, having a good, oh, with gentleness and respect. So not defensive, not angry, not, uh, and how... How do we not get angry with people who have a worldview? How do we not get angry with them and want to, you know, punch them out or whatever? Yes, Sister Whitaker. Wait, thank you. Think back to when we had a worldview. Yes, that's right. And, um, and how we wanted to be treated. You know, even though our worldview is skewed or wrong or whatever, we, uh, we wanted people to understand us. So uh, we need to understand. Um, you don't have to agree. Right, exactly right. But, you know, have enough compassion for your fellow human being to um, understand. Yeah. I think that's, that plays a, a huge in our approach with people is when we, we never forget where, where God brought you from and how we were treated when we came to the church. Now, I guess the problem would be that if you were raised in this uh, and you never knew what it was like to live in the world or have a worldview, I believe, and I've seen this, that it becomes easier for that person to uh, get angry with the atheists and with the people of the world community. Is that right? It's a lot easier, and so when you meet somebody, that's the reason why a lot of times I'll use that I was an atheist uh, testimony is because I do want people to know that um, I have compassion for how they think, and uh, a lot of times it does help. The book that I wrote, it, it helps to break the ice. A lot of times for me personally, it was when I'm talking to somebody and they say, if I invite him to church, for instance, and they say, well, I don't go to church because I'm not a church person. I can say, I remember I, remember I was just like you. I used to feel the, exactly the same way. And uh, so it kind of breaks the ice a little bit. It takes down those, uh, those barriers. But for somebody who does not have um, that uh, viewpoint that you were raised in this, and this is all you've ever known, that, that would be a difficult challenge. But it's still not impossible to be able to put yourself in the shoes of other people. Were you going to say something? No, okay. So we have a question here. The question that we might get asked that Peter says we should be able to give an answer for, and that would be, do you need to have faith to believe in God, or can you convince somebody uh, by facts or proof alone? In other words, can you prove that God exists without faith? That might be a question that... Um, an atheist might ask, right? That, well, I, I need proof that God exists. And um, so how would, how would you answer that? Anybody have a, a, take a stab at it? 
Do you need faith to believe in God? I would say you do. You do, yeah, absolutely you do. And, and th that is, th that is uh, the foundation of our faith, is our faith in God, right? And the only way that we can come to the Lord is through faith. But we have been given the ability, God has given us the ability to reason out facts. Is, that's, how we, we, that's how human beings reason out things is by looking at the proof, looking at the facts, looking at, and, and we use the facts in order to establish opinions and to discover truth. So God has designed us this way. So it's not, it isn't uh, a bad question for somebody to say, I need proof. And can you, you need to be able to prove and say, a lot of times people might say this, you might say, well, I, I don't know about that. All I, I feel God in my heart, or when I receive the Spirit of God, I, uh, that's how I know, and that's all the proof I need. Well, to somebody who does not have an experience, obviously, they, they, you're speaking foreign language. So how do we communicate with them? So here's what we say is, ultimately, it will take faith to believe in God. But bro what Brother Bernard said the other day, which I thought was very powerful, is he says, but it is a reasonable faith. It's not an unfounded faith on based on nothing. It is a reasonable faith. Say, so you know what? It takes some faith to believe in God. I'll, I'll give you that. But it takes faith to believe in all of the scenarios. But I believe that it's a reasonable faith. So you're leading them down a road. You've got to understand you're leading somebody down a road. We're not arguing the point. We're not telling them they're dumb. Right? We're not making belittling them. We're just going to take them on a journey about the existence of God, the possibility of the existence of God. This is important, I think. If you're talking to somebody who does not believe in the Bible and doesn't believe that God exists, all you have to do is convince them of the possibility of God. And once you crack that door open, then you close the deal. And I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, so here's, here's how do you defend your faith, your reasonable faith, without the Bible? Well, I'll tell you that uh, we, I, have, I have an experience. I do have an experience that transcends just the Bible. The Bible says that Jesus existed and all that. But uh, I, here, here's what Brother Bernard said. Brother Bernard says, all reason will tell you that I have a creator, my mother and father. Right? Right? So I can reasonably tell you that I have a mother, but he says I can go one further. I can introduce you to her. I know her. I talk to her, right? So it's not only just some mythical thing or some science fact. I can actually introduce you to this woman. Well, a Christian can say the same thing, that I, I think it's rational to believe that we were created by a creator, but I can do you one better. I can introduce you to them. And I can, I, you can have a conversation with this, with God, right? So I can rationally and logically convince you of this. Okay, so answer number two. That's answer number one is you tell them about your experience. I have an experience with God. This is what they asked me when they said, you got to take, you got to teach an atheist a Bible study. Um, and I said, well, I can't. I, I have to introduce them to him. If I can get them to an altar, if I can get them into a service where the spirit of God is moving and God begins to move upon them, then they are introduced to this, then I don't have to say anything. They'll have an experience, right? That's what happened with Chad, remember? Uh, they, uh, Kay wanted me to teach Chad a Bible study, and I said, no, I, I got to get him to church. So Sally tricked him into coming to church. Uh, and so, sure enough, he got the Holy Ghost and baptized and all that stuff. So uh, I didn't have to use any convincing at all, just getting, just introducing him to the Creator, right? Okay. So if they say, you've got to find out where they are if they're asking you questions. Brother Bernard says this. He says, you've got to find out um, where they stand. Like, do you believe that God even exists and, or whatever? Find out if they're agnostic or atheist or whatever. Uh, but if they're atheist, let's say they don't believe in God, they'll, they'll say this. Well, I know that God doesn't exist. And you could say, well, you, you know that. They'll, they'll say, yeah, I know God doesn't exist. And then you can say, well, how do you know? that he doesn't exist. That's good. That's good. Think, think about it. I want you to think about it. How do you know he doesn't exist? 
Have you searched, Brother Bernard, he said this, have you searched the whole universe? Have you been every single place and you have uncovered and turned every stone and you can positively say without beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can prove that there is no God? You see, it kind of gets that ball, it gets, the, well, what it does, it gets that gear stopped. <laughs> it kind of stops that gear, and they might say, you know, I don't, I can't, well, you can't prove he exists. No, okay, we'll give you that, but you can't prove he doesn't exist either. Right? You were to say something? I was yeah. thinking about, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have loved one for another. With the amount of hate going on in the world today, uh, for somebody to genuinely show love to someone they don't even know, that is a very powerful draw. Yeah. Why are you being nice to me? You don't know me. Right. I right. don't know you. Why? You know, and, and they really, they, it blows their mind. You know what? It's a good, it's a good witness. If somebody says to you, well, I'm, uh, I'm liberal or I'm a whatever, they know they're going to say something that they already know you're a Christian. And they already know it goes against what you believe. They already know that. But you don't jump on that bandwagon that everybody else does. That you genuinely just love them anyway. It's going to make it's going to make that uh, it's going to disarm them. And and then the, for you to go to somebody on the street and start having this conversation, I'm I'm going to say probably is not going to be that effective. But when you start to apply what we've been talking about for the last three weeks, remember, you gotta have an open mind. You gotta accept people. You gotta listen to people. You gotta love people. You've gotta seek first to understand before you're understood. If you do all of those things, you've already disarmed them. So now you're having a genuine conversation with somebody who's genuinely asking the questions. Does that make sense? Again, Jesus did not engage into every debate. He, he knew which ones he could. He knew which ones he was, he was going to communicate to and, and, and with. You already know somebody's agenda if they come up to you and they start uh, bashing you over the head with their agenda, right, or their beliefs. You know I'm not going to convince these people. They're, they're not seeking. But I'm going to tell you what, as an atheist myself, if I engage in a conversation with a Christian, I was genuinely wanting to ask them questions. And I was wanting them, and I'll be honest with you, I never came across a Christian that had the answers. They would always say, well, I just feel Jesus in my heart. Well, I have faith. The Bible says so. And I'd be like, sorry, I can't, I can't do that. I don't have enough faith yeah. to, to make that. I don't, I, don't, I don't have blind faith. It's what I used to call it, blind faith. So when Brother Bernard was going through this apologetics deal, and he was t t telling us how he would communicate with an atheist I'm going to tell you it resonated with me because I was like if somebody had said those things to me while I was an atheist it would have got those gears to stop and I would have stopped to listen and here's what he said he says if you can't prove that there is not a God prove it then you have to at least at the very minimum logically logically you've got to put God as a possibility Logically, now you've got to, you, this, these words are very important because for an atheist, everything has to be logical. Everything has to make, be rational and make sense. That's why they would choose science. And we'll talk a bit about this in another session. They'll, they'll, they'll choose science over faith because it has proof. Right? Okay. So let's consider the options, all right? So if you, can, if you tell the atheist person, you say, okay, if you can't prove there's not a God, then let's just, for the possibility's sake, possibly there is a God. Let's just go on that. Let's consider the options. The universe exists, right? Think anybody would argue with that, Brother Stowe? So. No. The uni there is a universe. An atheist would agree. There is a universe. So we can agree with that. So there are only three possibilities that the, that the universe exists. Number one is it's always been here. That is called an eternal universe theory. Eternal universe. It's always been here. And I would say as an atheist, when I was an atheist, I used to think of an eternal universe, that there was never a beginning. It's just always been here. Well, um, 
there's a problem with that. Science, even science disagrees with that theory because light would have reached us, light travels, right? And light travels from all over the universe. And if the universe had been here for forever, then all the light from all of the universe would have reached us by now and we would be in a constant state of light. It would just, we wouldn't have no darkness. Everything would be light. And so science would say, well, that's not the case. It can't have been here forever. Plus, they already know this. Scientifically, they can prove that the universe is expanding in a rapid expanse. So if we were here for, for bajillions of years, it would be, you know, whatever. It would be way bigger than it is now or whatever. So science proves that there's not. So the second theory would be the Big Bang Theory, and that is that uh, some quantum force blipped, right, and caused this explosion, and then there was a bang, and here we are. Um, I would say 50%, if not more, of the atheists believe in that theory. But you've got to ask the next question is, where did the quantum force field come from? There had to be something in order to bang, in order to make... Right? Because science will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that you cannot create matter without matter. You can't create something out of nothing. So in order for the Big Bang Theory to even play out, is there had to be something to begin with. Well, then where did that something come from? And they have no answers for that. So the third scenario is God created the universe. And I will agree that it takes faith to believe in any one of those three. Wouldn't you agree? You can ask, wouldn't you agree that it, it would take a little measure of faith to believe in the Big Bang? We weren't here. We didn't see it. We're, we're taking the word of, you know, of theories and just educated guesses. So it does take a measure of faith to put to believe in that or in the eternal universe or in God's creation, a creator created. Every scenario... Everybody they're, lives by faith all the time. Yeah, they do. Right? They yeah. flip a light switch on, they have faith, the lights are going to come on. So that's called natural faith. So yeah. ask them, tell, you know, tell them about their natural faith. That goes along with that. Yeah, so to believe that the universe created itself, it's going to take faith. But that God created it, it's going to take a measure of faith. But what I'm going to say and what I believe that is the third scenario is a reasonable faith. Right? It's not unreasonable. So now, factor in the experience that I have. So it's reasonable faith to believe in the third option, that God exists and God created the heavens and the earth. And now let me go back to my experience that I have, that I can share with you, that not only do I believe that God exists, but I believe I met God. And then their question will be, well, then prove that you met God. Can anybody prove that they met Jesus? I would say yes. How? By How sharing you? your story, about uh, sharing your testimony. Right. That's about right. what happened. I was in this direction. I, was, I had a death wish and da-da-da. And all of a sudden, I met the Lord in a service, the Holy Ghost power. I began to speak in an unknown language. I got baptized. I walked out a different person. That is convincing People will be so astounded, and they'll say, how, did, how can I get that? I've had yeah, them say, that's right. that, how can I let that happen to me? And there's the open door, because they will argue, you can't argue with a man with an experience. No, you cannot. You cannot argue with a man with an experience. And that is where you start to get. The, so once you've cracked that skull, so to speak, and you, and you bring in the light of the possibility of faith, the possibility of God, then you can say, now let me tell you about my personal experience with this, that I met God and I was this way and then I changed. There's not too many things on this planet that will cause a human being to change. Not like that. Uh, now, you add in the miraculous. I have seen blinded eyes opened. This is what God said. God said, you will prove the scripture and you will prove the testimony. You will prove the gospel with miracles and signs and wonders. 
So you can't, don't leave those on the table. You've got to bring them out and say, I have seen the dead raised. I've seen blinded eyes open. I've seen the lame get up and walk. I've seen these things, not just on television. I'm talking about, and you tell them the stories and stage four cancer victims. I, I've seen these things begin to happen. If you have not seen those things, then you need to do what I did when I first got in the church and beg and plead God, God, show me the miraculous. I want to experience these things. I don't want to read about them. I want to experience these things on my, personally. You have to ask, don't you? Yeah. Because I asked for 20 years to be able to see somebody raised from the dead through prayer only. And Pat Pat was the one that passed. He was sitting right in front of me at the church. He slumped forward, not realizing that that prayer was coming to pass right. at that moment. And so after that, it, look at the difference in the church I know, right? and the community and yeah. even the news media coming out. It was spread far and wide. And to this day, that gets people's attention. It does. When you can say, I've, I've been there when somebody was raised from the dead. Through you got to be careful because I was telling a lady behind the counter uh, one time about, you got to come to my church because I've seen the dead raised and the blinded eyes open. And then a couple weeks later, my wife went in and said, hey, you got to come to Hope Tabernacle. She said, oh, yeah, your husband was in here. He freaked me out. He's talking about dead people coming back to life. <laughs> so you gotta use you gotta use a little wisdom. Okay. Can't say it's science or faith. Right? You can't say that. It's science or faith. Because no matter what you believe, it's gonna take a measure of faith. It all takes faith. But Blaise Pascal's wager, this man he made, he says, here's the wager of eternity. And this is how he put it. We bet with our eternal lives. This is the wager, right? You're going to make a wager. Yeah. I'll bet 20 bucks on this, or I'll bet $100. You're not allowed to bet, but I'm just saying, it's a wager. We, we wager our eternal lives on this, on whether God exists or not. So, sir, if I could convince you that there is even the remote possibility, you, you've already showed the atheists that they have a little faith in these other things anyway. Why not just get, give God consideration? Just put God up there with the... So now they're not a, a, an atheist, they're agnostic, so you've moved them to another level. Yeah. And then you say, guess what? You're betting, you are betting your faith on your eternal life. So consider this. What if I'm wrong and there is no God? What about that? What if I'm wrong and there is no it's God? still the best life you've ever lived. It's the best life. Still the best life. Here's what Brother Bernard says. So between you and I, I make some lifestyle adjustments that I, that I would personally tell you that I, I'm going to live a more blessed life uh, because of it. In other words, I'm not going to be strung out on drugs and alcohol, and I'm not going to commit adultery, and I'm not going to do all of the things that I'm going to, you know, the Christians should live his life scripturally, right? And if we do that, then we will live a more blessed life just at the end of the day. Uh, and so we'll be more productive to the community. We will be more help to the community, right? So, so the very worst case is if I'm wrong, we both end up the same place in the ground. That's it. But what if, but what if the possibility, what if you're wrong? Then where are we going to end up? So this, if you got the, 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 the gear stopped in any way in all this conversation, to make them just consider the what if factor. And then you, this is what you close the deal. So we're talking about closing the deal. Then you have to have them consider eternity. And once they have considered the possibility of God and they've considered eternity, then you're, you're gonna really keep, have them thinking 